Welcome everybody to our weekly webinar series. I'm your host, David Mayeski, and we'll be talking about understanding executive functioning part two. So we're gonna do a little bit of a, review, of a review of what executive functioning is, and we're gonna go over a little bit of ideas of how we can maybe help support people maybe struggling with some of these things. So let me just pull up here on my screen. Let me just kind of whip through here. We're going to hit the share button in just a second. All right. Can all of you see the screen? It should say executive functions. Okay. So just real quick as a review, inhibition, that was my ability to stop my behavior at the appropriate time, right? So someone who struggles with that, maybe they take a joke a little bit too far. Uh, maybe they keep arguing and you may say, look, enough. Okay. I don't want to hear any more. That's usually when someone keeps going. That might be an example of somebody who struggles a little bit with inhibition. Right? It's like the opposite of impulsivity. Right. Number two, we talked about shifting, particularly it's not exclusive to those neurodiverse learners, uh, but a lot of neurodiverse learners are going to have a hard time shifting so kind of think about that shifting positions, whether it's shifting like if plans change, right? It could be shifting about, hey, I came up with my idea and Mindy isn't picking my idea. And so I can't really, like, I'm going to insist that we, even though her idea is better, quite frankly, I can't let go of it, uh, the idea that I came up with, right? So that ability to think flexibly. Number three, emotional control. And I feel like probably almost every student at Aspira, regardless of what group they're in, probably struggles with this emotional control, right? Balancing my emotional responses by using rational thoughts and feelings. So it's not the absence of feelings. Again, uh, sometimes people hear me sort of feeling bashing, uh, but to the contrary, it's combining rational thoughts and feelings. Our feelings are not bad, right? They just can get out of control sometimes. So it's being able to use rational thoughts with those feelings. Uh, next one was initiation, right? Initiation, we talked that, about that one, that, that a person could look lazy or they're just procrastinating. Uh, but it may be that I have an inability to begin a task or to come up with ideas or to problem solve. If I'm not good at that, my homework could feel truly like an overwhelming task. Now, there are kids that don't want to do their homework, for sure. But for some kids, it may be because I don't know how to get started. Right? I know I have an essay due, and the teacher said I could pick the topic. So I don't know where to even begin with that, or how do I narrow that down, or how do I execute a three-pronged thesis statement. The task itself might be limiting my ability to initiate and therefore procrastinate. Number five, working memory. Again, that was the thing I used the example. Uh, Carrie, we're gonna test your working memory from one week. This would be really impressive. Do you remember there were three things that I told my kid to go upstairs and get? Any chance you remember? Um, slippers, brush their teeth, and a robe. Wow. Slippers, brush their teeth. I think it might have been a, a, a backpack or glass. Slippers, brush their teeth, and a robe. It, it was a robe? Yeah. Right on, right on. I, okay, they, I, I only remember two of the things that I asked. I, I remember it was a toothbrush, right? So with working memory, it's our ability to kind of pull information. <laughs> So if I share something at four o'clock, one of the challenges could be by the end of the webinar, if I struggle with executive functioning in this particular specific example of working memory, I mean, you just went over it an hour ago, but I don't remember what that inhibition thing was, right? I'm having a hard time recalling it. Those with great working memory can hear it and kind of put it, this is kind of, this is our short-term memory. This is our long-term memory here in the back. All right, so once it gets into long-term memory, like my mom, who is in her mid-70s, 
Boy, she can tell me every one of her teacher's name from elementary school. But if I asked her if she went to the store yesterday, right, she struggles with that. As we get older, sometimes that the short term, the stuff that's happened more recently doesn't get moved back into long term. But I can recall older information, even though something might have happened more recently. Right? For our students, I think that usually happens where I'm in a lecture, I'm kind of listening, but I didn't really take great notes. And now I'm relying on my ability to recall what was spoken. And again, I had mentioned only about three out of 100 people learn best by hearing things, right? It's a terrible way to learn. Problem is that's the way that I learn best. Most of us, like what I would call normal human beings, we learn best by doing or by seeing, like watching someone else do the activity and then I can try to do it. Or uh, I'm actually doing the activity, right? I'm learning how to cook, right? Not by reading about it but by like cracking the eggs into the bowl and uh, mixing them up to make scrambled eggs. Okay. So working memory, if I'm not uh, really paying attention or even if I was, but my working memory wasn't strong, it'd be like pouring water, maybe a little bit into a colander, right? It just, it's not gonna hold that much. So my ability to recall it, if I don't remember it and review it within maybe a few hours, the likelihood that I'll remember it four weeks from now on the test is really slim, right? So a great strategy, and we'll talk about some of these a little bit more this evening, a, a great strategy would be go to the lecture, take notes, look at your notes when you get home, and the next day rewrite those notes in a more organized format. And that gives me four different opportunities for it to go from short-term to long-term, right? It's constantly reinforcing. Now, one of the hard parts is those strategies are usually not appealing to people who struggle with working memory. It just seems like a lot of work and I don't wanna do that. Okay. Uh, number six, right, was planning an organization. Uh, my wife is out of town. So I can say loudly that like, yes, that was like what my wife's cabinets look like. <clears throat> planning an organization and what we call number seven, <clears throat> the organization of materials. It's being able to put order into what could seem like chaos. Right, so we talked about toys, right? Maybe there's a bin full of dinosaur toys and that's very different than superhero toys. And that might be very different than horses, right? They each might have their own bin, right? If I struggle with that, right? Like my kids and me, right? I might just dump all the toys into one big old thing. Now, the problem with that is that means a kid might dump out everything in that bin, even though they're only looking for one or two toys. Most of the things that get dumped out don't end up getting played with. I just see them all and then I pick the one that I want and the 999 are all kind of out there, right? So if you're someone who is good at this, you will notice that uh, my wife used to call me a tornado. She says that I always know where you are because there's a trail of you, right? Your laptop will be on the first flat surface that you see, then your coat will be on the next one, your keys will be on the third. So there's like a trail of me all throughout the house where she says any flat surface you just put stuff down on. Uh, even though we do have, this is very interesting, not only a place to hang our keys when you first walk in, it's even labeled keys. It is a metal uh, thing that is on the wall and says keys. And I remember thinking one day, like, that'd be a great place. I could just put my keys right on that hook. And my wife is like, oh my gosh, right? Like, you're just thinking, I, we've had this for like years and you're like, oh, cool. When did we get this thing? I could actually, I have a hook on my keys that would go right on this thing. And she's like, that's the point of it. So there are some people that are just naturally good with these things. And some people it's not easy. So again, the organization of materials, right? Imposing order on work or play or storage spaces, right? I'm making checklists. I'm, I'm going to think about things like, oh, I want the passport with me at all times right? It's possible luggage gets separated from you. So if your luggage is still in Atlanta and you've arrived at another country and you put the passport in your checked luggage, right? People who are good at organization of materials never make that mistake, right? People like me don't bring a bathing suit going to Hawaii because I just didn't think about it when I was packing. I packed shirts and shorts, but I didn't really, bathing suit was just sort of off, off the periphery. Right? So there's some people that are really good at this and some people really struggle. So when you ask someone to take notes, 
I may not take notes very well, or I might just write every single thing that Joe says, but Joe might have, if you're like a professor at the University of Maryland, when I was there in the 80s, they were a little bit older, they'd kind of go off on a tangent and I would write everything down and like, wait, that doesn't have anything to do with US history up until the Civil War. He was talking about President Kennedy's assassination and there were more assassinations in, the, in Dallas, Texas, including the President of the United States in 1963 than in the entire United Kingdom combined. I still remember that from 1988. And he said that, I promise you, every single class, three days a week, 16 weeks, 48 times, it was a class about history up to the Civil War. There was no natural connection. But young Dave Mayeski, who is not a good organization of materials, I wrote it down, right? That's why I can recall it now, because I probably wrote it down almost 50 different times. It never appeared on a test. It was nothing that was ever relevant. It was a mere tangent. So if you struggle, you might just write every single thing down. So when you go to review, it might be really hard to like, wait, that doesn't even make sense. Why did he say that? What does that have to do with, oh man. And so then you can struggle a little bit that way. And then last one, again, self-monitoring. That's my ability to look at my performance and kind of compare that to like a typical standard. So when my kids say like, oh, I made my bed, we've had the discussion of what is they're making the bed and how would mom make the bed. So they now understand there's a difference between those two and what they call making the bed is what I would call a feeble attempt to sort of throw the covers up toward the pillow. It's still wrinkled. The pillow might even be on the floor, but they're like, oh. What else do I have to do, right? So they would think, hey, I've made my bed. And we would say, well, that's not maybe what, how we would say making the bed would look. And <clears throat> we've even had to get better at like taking a picture of what something might look like. So if they don't remember how to put things back, which I don't know what it is about our kids, but their brains definitely work like a colander in that fashion. If it means putting things back where you got them, very little clue our kids. And our kids are really bright, but boy, they, they could not put something back where they got it from in the exact spot ever, right? But I might think that like, oh yeah, that's good enough, or that's fine, or that's exactly where it was, where it may not be that at all, okay? So those are the big executive functioning areas. So I'm going to show you just a little clip of a video here. Um, and this is uh, an example. If you struggle with some executive functioning, I just want you to pay attention to what are some executive functioning traits that you think are either very strong in this video or any executive functioning traits that you think may be lacking. Okay, so I'm gonna use some of your recall of those, the great eight. So this is, there's a character, there was a TV show called The Big Bang Theory. I think it sort of made autism a little bit more mainstream. Now, they never use that word very much on the show, uh, but it was very clear. These are folks who are really, really smart, but really struggle with some social pragmatics, struggle with relationship develop, development. And so Sheldon, the main character here, he has just created an algorithm to make friends. So let's watch. And then I want you to think about what executive functioning skills did you see? And were there any that maybe were lacking? just in time. I believe I've isolated the algorithm for making friends. <laughs> Sheldon, there is no algorithm for making friends. Well, well, hear him out. If he's really onto something, we could open a booth at Comic-Con, make a fortune. <laughs> See, my initial approach to Kripke had the same deficiencies as those that played Stu the Cockatoo when he was new at the zoo. <laughs> Stu the Cockatoo? Yes. He's new at the zoo. <laughs> It's a terrific book. I've distilled its essence into a simple flow chart that will guide me through the process. Have you thought about putting him in a crate while you're out of the apartment? Hello, Kripke. Yeah, Sheldon Cooper here. It occurred to me that you hadn't returned any of my calls because I hadn't offered any concrete suggestions for pursuing our friendship. Yeah, perhaps the two of us might share a meal together. Yeah, I see. Well, then perhaps you'd have time for a hot beverage. <laughs> Popular choices include tea, coffee, cocoa. 
I see. No, 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 wait, don't hang up yet. But what about a recreational activity? I bet we share some common interests. You tell me an interest of yours. You, really? On actual horses? <laughs> tell me another interest of yours. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I have no desire to get in the water till I absolutely have to. <laughs> Of interest of yours. Uh oh, he's stuck in an infinite loop. I can fix it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But it's interesting, but isn't ventriloquism by definition a solo activity? <laughs> yeah. I mean, tell me another interest of yours. Hmm. Is there any chance you like monkeys? <laughs> what is wrong with you? Everybody likes monkeys. <laughs> Hang on, Kripke. A loop counter and an escape to the least objectionable activity. Howard, that's brilliant. I'm surprised you saw that. Yeah. Gee, why can't Sheldon make friends? All right, Kripke, that last interest strikes me as the least objectionable, and I would like to propose that we do that together tomorrow. Yes, I'll pay. <laughs> Goodbye. All right. Time to learn rock climbing. <laughs>
There may be other areas that are limited, but it's not an umbrella term, right? There's usually eight specific areas. So we wanna be careful not to label someone either because they are organized that they must be great with executive functioning or if they're disorganized, meaning that, well, they couldn't be good at the other ones, right? But certainly those shift, the initiation, maybe a little bit of the inhibition, right? Like, could he stop? He kept pushing and pushing a little bit there. So if we wanna figure out how do we improve these interactions, there's a four word acronym, right? And the acronym will spell PEER. Now this was developed by an educational consultant, Marsha Rubenstein, and oh, do I miss her. Uh, there are just rare times in your life where you just feel like you are in the presence of just, I would say just greatness, right? She was amazing. She was a Harvard and Brandeis graduate and was just one of the kindest and most intelligent people that I had met. And she had a, a several kids uh, that one, I think, was clearly on the spectrum. This was maybe in the late 70s, early 80s. And we didn't really talking about this very much, right? Smart people, like they, they weren't called autistic. Autistic were um, only labeled, I think, kids who maybe were nonverbal, right? So smart kids, we didn't really know what to do with that. Well, there's also something else that, um, and she has developed, if you're ever curious about um, what's called a nonverbal learning disability or NV or NLD, as it may be called. Uh, that's usually where your verbal IQ is about a 15 point uh, or more gap higher than your perceptual reasoning, right? And so um, that creates kind of, anytime there's a 15 point gap within these IQ segments, uh, that would be considered a disability. And so she had a couple other boys that like, it just, there were things that they weren't getting, but it was a little different than the autism. And so she really, I, I think I, I would call her, right, the founder of this sort of nonverbal learning piece. And she wrote an amazing book, if you ever want, if you think that this could be the case for your, your student, uh, it is called Raising NLD Superstars raising NLD superstars. And it's really a wonderful read and a lot of real life examples of things that if conversations have been very difficult for you and your child, like maybe a different approach to take. I remember her sharing um, with uh, a mom and a daughter came in to visit her at her practice. And she was recalling that her son, like some of these executive functioning things that were difficult for him, he said, you know, mom, like, I have to have my bowl of cereal first thing every morning. I just have to. And to be honest, if the house was on fire and I hadn't had my bowl of cereal, I don't know that I would leave, right? So she was using this as an example. And so the mom, understandably, the mom was like, oh, gosh, no. Well, that's nothing like my daughter, right? That doesn't describe her at all. And so the mom asked the daughter, like, hey, if the house was on fire, like, would you leave? And she's like, of course. And the mom's like, ah, see? And the daughter paused and said, but it would be very uncomfortable, right? That was a little bit of a glimpse that like with some of the neurodiversity and sometimes some of these executive functioning skills being impaired, right? That's, that's that difficulty with shift, right? I haven't had my cereal yet. Yes, I know the house is on fire. I know it's dangerous, but I haven't had my bowl of cereal. Now, for each kid, it might be another standard deviation more difficult, but at a minimum, there are kids out there that that would be really uncomfortable. They could do it, but it would be very hard. She noticed, uh, gosh, she had just had a funny way of telling stories, and she shared that her, her middle son, she's like, hey, like, you need to put on these jeans. And he's like, I don't want to wear them, right? And she's like, they were good enough for your brother. They're good enough for you, right? I mean, that was the generation of hand-me-downs. And he lacked the language to explain to her. It's not that I don't like jeans, that I think they're stupid, but that's all that he was saying and all that he was communicating. But what she ended up discovering much later was it was actually the texture the way the jeans feel against his skin, 
how the jeans generally like what makes jeans usually nice, right? A little tight, right? Now baggy jeans have become in, right? Maybe there wouldn't have been so much of these sensory kids growing up, but like in the 70s and 80s, when you were growing up wearing jeans, at least that's when I was getting put in a pair of jeans, right? They were tight. And so he didn't know how to explain it, but they felt very uncomfortable. And so he just said, I'm not wearing it. And so she recalls lots of stories like this, where there were things that she's like, I was just missing. I didn't understand, right? Um, she would be very proud to say that she, she says, I am a stereotypical, loving, smothering Jewish mother. And so like hugs and affection are very big for her. She has three boys that it was very uncomfortable for them. But they didn't know how to say like, hey, it's uncomfortable. They're like, ew, gross, stop hugging me. And that was very difficult for her, right? She didn't understand why. So part of her work, she created this PEER acronym. And so PEER stands for Preview, Educate, Evaluate, and Review. Preview, right? Preview, particularly with students, right? They could have spectrum traits. Previewing, as a, it's an anti-anxiety pill, right? Hey, so you're leaving a Spiro next week. We're going to meet you at the airport. How am I going to get there? Okay, great question. So the Aspiro team, they're going to take you to the airport. Well, then how will I find you? Okay, great question. So they're going to bring you to our gate where our plane lands, or we will meet you at baggage claim when we get off the plane, right? But kids who have a lot of questions, sometimes in a assuming that everything was a neurotypical world, that kid could sound pretty annoying, right? Well, how am I going to get there? When am I going to meet you? What if your plane is delayed? I would, okay, stop. All right. Like one question at a time, right? That can be, can be a little off-putting to us, right? But for some students that pre think of the preview as an anti-anxiety medication, knowing what's going to happen. Now, we have a 14-year-old that has a lot of these qualities, right? He's an awkwardly smart kid. I should have known that at two. He was putting a 50-piece puzzle together by himself without looking at the box. That's unusual. Not always a great thing, because if your brain is working that strong in one area, there might be another area that doesn't work quite as well, right? But it's not typical that that would be the case for most two-year-olds, right? Most two-year-olds aren't doing that, right? But my wife had been previewing with him every day, unbeknownst to me, they had, and they had a routine. She always put him to bed. They read a story ever since he was little, like in her arms, little. And until he was probably eight or 10, she would read him a story, tuck him in. And unbeknownst to me, she would preview for him the day, right? Hey, so maybe if uh, some schools have like an A and a B day schedule, or, hey, this is the day that you have recess or this is a day that you're taking your lunch, or if you have working parents, hey, here's who's picking you up. Because it could be mom, could be dad, could be any number of the grandparents, right? So previewing was very helpful. And it was almost like the stereotype of giving a kid a warm glass of milk, patting them on the head and you know, telling them to go to bed. And he'd go right to sleep. So I remember one night he was probably eight or nine, Anyway, I'm putting him to bed and he says, hey, dad, what's tomorrow? And I'm like, mm, yeah, I, I don't know, but what's tomorrow? And so he says it again, this time a little bit more sternly, what's tomorrow? So now at this point, I'm thinking, okay, there's obviously something big tomorrow that I'm forgetting. Like, okay, I'm going through my Rolodex of things like, okay, it's not his birthday. Like, it's not a parent-teacher conference. Like, I, I don't remember him having a project or anything. I'm like, but I, I don't know, like you tell me, obviously there's something that's happening tomorrow that you know that I don't. So I'm being a little annoyed thinking he is actually playing with me, making me feel small for not knowing what's going on, right? But now at this point, finally, this brilliant analyst of human behavior that I am, my son is almost crying now saying, what's tomorrow? I finally get it. He doesn't know what tomorrow brings, and he just needs me to work through that with him. And I got it. And then I'm like, oh, okay, so tomorrow, 
I'll be taking you to school. Papa, that's grandpa, right? Papa will be picking you up and he's going to be in the white whale, right? They, ha they have two minivans, right? My, both my in-laws each have a minivan, one blue, one white, just the two of them, right? But so there's the blue shark and the white whale. And so we needed to let him know who's picking him up and in what car so that he's not just looking for my vehicle or the vehicle that took him to school, but just walking him through that. And he was fine. But without that, that was very difficult for him if plans were to change. So maybe mom picks him up. Now our 12 year old, he's a little less uh, uh, stuck and uh, less rigid with some of these things. He would love it if his mom picked him up. But for Josh, even though he might be happy to see my wife, it would be very uncomfortable if we told him the night before that grandpa was picking him up, right? It'd be a little out of sorts. Now for some kids, right? they would actually throw a fit and we're like oh my gosh what's the big deal so I can't like papa got held up and so I was able to pick you up not a big deal for those of us who don't struggle with some of these executive functioning things it wouldn't be a big deal but for someone who has a hard time shifting and once I knew the plan deviating from that plan can be really really difficult okay so previewing is really important okay Second thing, right? Second thing would be giving your child as much specific information related to the event or situation as possible. So maybe I'm previewing, hey, so you're going to your first high school party, right? If uh, your kids are older, maybe you can recall that, right? But you may be walking through that. So the first part of the preview might be, hey, so I'm gonna drop you off. Yes, I know, I'll drop you off around the corner so you can walk up to the front door yourself. We'll meet at the assigned meeting location at 11 o'clock. I will text you at 1055 saying I'm on my way. And by 11 o'clock, like I expect you to be out here, right? So that's kind of previewing the events. The education would be more about what he might experience or she might experience at this particular first high school party. So we might talk about, hey, you know, so one of the things, D, that could come up, I don't know if it will, but it could come up like, there could be drugs or alcohol at this party. Uh, there's not going to be. Okay. It'd be great if there's not. I would love it, right? But just on the off chance that there could be, let's walk through how you might interact with that. Well, what do you mean? Right. Well, so like, what if someone offered you, well, I don't even know the people there, so no one would offer me anything because I don't know them. Oh, okay. Uh, what if someone you knew were to ask you for that, right? And so it's just kind of educating them about possible things that they might experience, right? So the first preview might be the nuts and bolts, the, the logistics of it, the dropping off, the picking up, where to meet, I'll send you a text. The education will be around, well, you know, again, I, I'm going to oversimplify this. Like, you know what, if someone who I didn't know offered me drugs and alcohol, I would think that would be very easy to say no to. But... I mean, I guess if someone I like that, like that would, that would be harder for sure. Right. So it's maybe walking them through. All right. So then what might you say, right. If someone that, you know, asks you to do that. Right. So it's previewing this situation that could come up and educating them about some options or even for some things to consider. Okay. So previewing, educating. Okay. So again, um, if, you know, maybe you're educating them about potential dangers they may face, maybe even doing a role play. They may think it's stupid. I don't care. My kids know I'm cheesy, so it doesn't bother me. If it bothers you, that's okay. But I, I don't mind role playing with the kids just for them to think about things. Again, if I struggle with emotional control, right? My emotions are back here. If I struggle controlling those emotions, when I'm excited or something seems fun, I might jump at the opportunity to do it. And I hadn't thought through about, ooh, this could, if I leave the party and go somewhere else, what if I can't get back on time, right? How I communicate that with, and my mom or my dad said they would pick me up at 11 o'clock, okay? So evaluate. Evaluate, that might be sometime within, well, let's say within 24 hours. It could be, let's say if it was a first high school party and they're getting home at 11 o'clock, you may talk about, hey, how did the party go? 
right? So you're evaluating the experience and hey, is there anything that came up that maybe we didn't anticipate? This is where you might say, well, if you mean, did you tell me that what if my ex-girlfriend shows up with some other guy at the party? No, you didn't bring that up, right? Oh, so how'd you handle that, right? So you can understand if I struggle with emotional control, that may be where a fight might break out. If you struggle with shifting, right? I didn't anticipate that happening, right? And I struggle with controlling my emotions or I may struggle initiating that conversation. They came up to me and said, hey, and then I don't know what to do there. Or, well, I everyone punches that guy. That's just what happens, dad. Everyone does. Like, well, everyone might want to, for sure. I don't know that everyone does that, right? So depending on uh, what executive functioning skill that you perceive may have come up, or if you already know there's some executive functioning skills that you know are difficult, right? Let's make sure to talk about those a little bit more, right? So that we could talk about the decision-making pro process. If, if it's a little bit later, maybe that time of night is not the right time. So maybe the next morning, but you want to evaluate within maybe about 24 hours of a situation happening. And now review, and if this seems redundant or repetitious or repeating things over and over, that's exactly what it is. And it's intentional by design. It's trying to take new information to be stored into long-term memory. So now, now we're reviewing everything. Hey, so you know what? So last week we talked about going to your first high school party, right? And we went over the logistics and how'd that go? It was fine, okay? You dropped me off, you picked me up, just like we said. Great. Yes. So we're reviewing the whole thing. So we're reviewing the preview part. And then, hey, we talked about some things that could come up, right? Uh, we talked about like, if someone were to offer you marijuana or alcohol or something like that, like, how would you handle that? Um, then when you got home, gosh, oh man, I felt bad. There were a couple things that we didn't anticipate happening, right? Like your ex showing up. Right. And yeah, we didn't talk about like how that might feel and based on how that might feel, what, how might you respond? Yeah. Anything else. Right. So as you're previewing, as you're educating, as you're evaluating, then your review, maybe a couple of days afterwards is reviewing the entire prospect from beginning, middle to end. Okay. So it's that entire process. Right. Anything that came up that we hadn't previewed. Any new information that we could have educated you better or that knowing what we know now, you're more prepared for the next interaction? Again, if there's specific executive functioning skills that you know your student struggles with, all right, let's check in about that. Hey, did you feel like you controlled your emotions? Yeah, I made sure that they didn't know that I was so upset. Okay, how did you do that? Right. So it's being able to, if they've done something well, asking them to talk, talk you through it. How did they maintain control when it might have been really easy to blow a gasket? Right. If they struggle with inhibition, right? Like knowing how to stop. Well, you know, in the past, um, I wanted people to remember me. So I might make a joke that's really kind of extreme. I, I just wanted people to laugh or at least remember me, like being ignored feels worse. Oh, okay, that makes sense. So some of these situations you've got into before, you hadn't really thought through, you just wanted people to remember you. Okay, how did you handle that this time? Well, I decided that maybe I don't want people to remember me as the class clown. Oh, wow, okay. So what did you do different, right? So you're kind of walking them, it's constantly previewing, educating, evaluating, and review. And then you're repeating that for just about any situation. Hey, you know what? Your, your first day back from home and you're gonna be starting school tomorrow. Um, do you know where you're going to class, right? Or maybe, maybe you've already dropped them off. Maybe it's the same school, but maybe it's a new school, right? And maybe they haven't had a chance to you know, get around, right? So. Hey, how, how do you feel like uh, you'll do if you're not sure where to go? Okay, mom, stop asking. I'll, I'll ask somebody, okay? 
stop annoying me, right? But it's it's that repetition, right, of them walking with, oh yes, okay, I can go to the guidance counselor. I know where the office is. It's as soon as you walk in. Okay, so if you're not sure where to go, you can go to the office, great, okay? Anything else you, what about, um, to me, things that I might ask someone if it's their first day back, like, what about lunch, right? Lunch is that, that's that popularity contest where no one feels like they're winning, right? So if it's my first day back, but maybe school's been in session for a few weeks, maybe I don't have anybody picked out that I'm sitting with, which then I might be inclined to sit by myself which might spiral me down into having a pretty bad day, right? So you won't be able to anticipate everything. I don't want this to be a long, long conversation, but big things that could come up, right? For, uh, believe me, for our kid, again, the putting the puzzle together as a two-year-old, but like we really weren't sure he'd be able to get into his locker. And so on back to school night, we went there and mom had the combination and said, okay, I want you to try it great. Now I want you to, I'm going to mess it up and I want you to try it again. I want you to try it again. And he got annoyed every single time, but I promise if we didn't practice that thing three times, he might still be trying to get into his books, right? The smartest kid might not turn in any homework because it's in his locker that he can't open, right? So there may be certain things if it's something they haven't done before, whether it's going to a party, opening a locker, maybe driving to school and trying to find a parking spot on campus, all those kind of things would be things that we want to use this peer program with. Okay, so I'm going to send you a copy of the slides, as well as a copy of the recording a little bit later on. This I really love. This is uh, it's maybe a year or two older, but it's bestvalueschools.org. It's colleges for students with autism slash and what doesn't fit on there. Also, just executive functioning struggles. And it goes over not only each school, but what I loved about this link, that means you have to love it too, is that it explained why, right? So college A, not just college A does well with executive functioning, but here's what they do. It's maybe their class size or their ability to do more hands-on learning rather than relying on traditional lecture format. Maybe it's the size of the classes. Maybe it's the resources they have at the learning center on campus, right? So I've heard them now called learning centers versus the disability office, right? Once something's probably, and hopefully that is like moving its way out of language, but if something's called disability services, how many kids do you think would go there, right? But if it's the you know learning center or um, center for student growth and development or whatever it is, but uh, when you be able to click on this link that I'll send out to you, um, you'll be able to see like 25 really great values of schools and why they would work well. And then based on what ex executive functioning issues you may or may not have, there may be certain ones that might fit for you. So whether you're looking at colleges for next fall, whether you're looking for this fall, or if it's still a couple of years away, it may be a good resource for you to have. So. All right, any questions about what we've gone over so far today? Any questions about either what the executive functioning issues are, um, ideas on how to help uh, anybody? Maybe there's like a particular executive function that like, oh, after you explained it, like this one is like really a lead balloon for our family. Uh, any, any thoughts, comments? Is it is it common for um, autistic spectrum to overlap with executive function deficits? I think so. I think so. Pretty pretty highly. At, at a minimum, I, most kids, not all, but most kids on the spectrum, probably the shift number two and the emotional control number three. And and as we walk through it, it starts to make sense that like well. Yeah, if I have a hard time shifting, I'm probably going to be angry a lot, right? And when I'm angry, I'm probably having a harder time controlling my emotions, which could lead to other problems. So let's say I'm disorganized and I've done my homework, but oh, if you're like my kid, things go to die in his backpack, right? I mean, it just gets shoved in there and like, right, who knows where it is? We're like, okay, there was a permission slip, right? He's an eighth grader and he's doing this dual immersion program. And so he gets high school credit. 
as long as it turns this magic form in by last Friday. And so like every day we're like wonder like we needed a backup plan as a just in case because we're like, uh, I need to not get high school credit because he doesn't turn a form in. But like, were we were we confident? No, uh, we didn't do it for him, which I was glad, uh, but we wanted to, we sure wanted to. Uh, and then when he got home, we're like, hey, did you turn that in? He's like, I sure did, first thing. We're like, great. Now there was a lot of previewing. Hey, don't forget in your backpack. In fact, we're gonna put it right in the front folder, right in the front folder, not loose, <laughs> smushed behind his sandwich and his books and all that kind of stuff. So previewing it, and hey, so what are you gonna do when you go to Chinese class? Like, I'm gonna turn the form in, I know, I know, but it's that repetition, even though it might be frustrating, repetition is what allows it to stick. I think kids on the spectrum, they can, again, much like what we saw with the character Sheldon, they can be brilliant minds, but also there's what looks like common sense or day-to-day -day things that can be challenging and difficult. The problem is like, I think like, honestly, I think I have a lot of these qualities myself and I would hear things like, oh gosh, you just don't have any common sense, but you're so smart. Like it actually wasn't very nice to say that to someone. Like I didn't understand why someone's telling me, well, this is so obvious. Why can't you do that? But you can do algebra as a fifth grader. Like, I don't know either. Right. But like, I just like my backpack, I just put everything in the backpack. And I didn't really think about like separating it by subject or like I, I wasn't going to bring a three hole puncher to school and punch it and then open up the notebook and then put the stuff away and then close it back up. Or I would just rip it out of the binder. Right. And so I was the person that had like the three little rips. Like that stuff just it didn't come natural to me. It didn't make sense to me. Imposing order on materials doesn't make sense to me naturally. I have to work really, really hard at it. So I think sometimes there are kids that have, these are skills. The good thing that I'm learning now, I, I didn't know what executive functioning was when I was growing up, but these are skills and these can be taught, right? IQ is pretty fixed, right? But the skills can be taught, but I do think there is a disproportionate amount of kids on the spectrum that also have multiple executive functioning things. And at a minimum, probably that, um, shifting in the emotional control for sure. And then you could see how, um, why do I want to do a new task? I might not do it very well, which is going to have me frustrated. And then mom's going to be frustrated that I'm frustrated. And then so like, I'm just not going to do it. Right. So initiation, I think kids on the spectrum, it's not that they're never lazy, but I think they look lazier than they are. Because what I'm doing is I'm avoiding something that is uncomfortable. If you ask me to climb 100 feet on a rope, I will avoid that because that makes me very uncomfortable, right? So it's not that it's good and not that it's bad, but in my case, I'm like, I feel very smart for avoiding something that makes me that uncomfortable. I think the same thing happens for kids with learning. If being in a discussion class and I don't maybe process information so quickly or my working memory isn't as strong, I'm probably not raising my hand saying, hey, Carrie, could you explain that again to me? I don't, I don't, I'm a little bit lost. Ha ha, other kids at school probably laugh or I feel like they're going to. So I am not going to say anything. I'm not letting the teacher or anybody else know that I'm struggling. And so I'll sit there and I'll learn how to doodle. I'll, I'll learn how to look like I'm busy or I'll just be quiet and not cause a scene. But I may be struggling just as much as executive functioning as the kid that's kind of bouncing on the seat and bouncing off the wall. Um, I, I do hear a little bit, I get parents asking the question like, so is ADHD, is that like executive functioning? Um, I think just think about that maybe a little bit like the autism piece where it's a lead balloon. Uh, it's pretty rare that ADHD is gonna help other than maybe shift. The ability to shift and adapt and like do something different on the spur of the moment that one, that one probably helps out. Most of the other ones, ADHD is not a friend generally to executive functioning. So I think autism, ADHD, and sometimes you may find out like, hey, I used to think maybe you had to have one or the other of these things. You could have autistic spectrum traits and ADHD traits, which means executive functioning is probably gonna be really hard and without a lot of practice of getting other skills um, 
things like a structured school day are going to feel like rat poison to kids like that. Oh, are you back on mute? Sorry. I am. I just said thank you. <laughs> oh, no, for sure. For sure. Any other questions before we finish here today? So, Dave, how do you test for executive functioning? Would it be through like a neuropsychological? Yes. One of the things that is really, well, I think it's really neat. I, yes and no. I wish every kid, by the time they were a sixth grader, had psychological testing, right? But they now have executive functioning skills subset tests in there. And they can point out not only like, oh, which ones, right? Because again, we learned the last couple of weeks, I might be really high on some of these, really low on other ones. I think because I've been studying this so much, I kind of start interacting with students. Uh, a lot of times therapists, teachers are probably the best ones to diagnose it, to be quite honest. But given if you have any concerns, you might say, hey, so here's some different executive functioning skill sets. Uh, could you let me know like, if you're seeing any struggles with this, right? Sometimes I, I might even just look at someone's notes, right? Are they able to take notes, right? Or like, and because maybe it's like, well, it's boring. Like, why would I write everything down that they just said? But one of the things that I'm learning, a lot of kids don't know how to study. So these neuropsychological tests. And in fact, now there, there's some really good books. I think it's called like Smart and Scattered, uh, I think is a book out there. And it even has like a little test that uh, you can get the book online, I believe. Uh, but it, it'll give you a little subset test of like 40 questions and, and it'll start to, to give you a pretty good idea. But you can even just uh, do a Google search of like executive functioning like tests. Uh, I always think it'd be great to do pre-tests and post-tests, right? Let's say if your kid is going to a treatment program post a Spiro, have them do an executive functioning test when they get there and then see what it looks like maybe midway through, right? These tests don't take that long. Uh, and then maybe see at the end and then see like where they've improved. Because for a lot of kids, like school feels overwhelming when I don't know how to study, right? I've been smart, but now all of a sudden my lack of study skills that's why I think executive functioning and study skills should absolutely be a class and it should start in fifth or sixth grade. Because I, what happens is I get a lot of juniors that now don't want to go to college because all of a sudden high school seems way too hard. So they think, oh, I was only like 10th grade smart, but I'm not any smarter than that. And so like, I, I'm not even going to bother with college, right? Where it, just being able to teach them some of these skill sets and how to improve these executive functioning areas they could really thrive in lots of environments, lots of jobs, whatever. But great question, Mindy. Anything else? All right. Well, next week, I think we're going to tackle, uh, let's see, what are we tackling next? I think we're back to our how to be responsible to, not responsible for. So if any of you, if you started with that about 10 weeks ago, you may say like, Hey, I want to come back to that. Again, for our alumni, you're welcome to continue to come back and watch these. Sometimes with all this knowledge that you have over the last two and a half months, you're like, I think I understand this presentation a lot better than I did 10 weeks ago. I didn't even uh, quite get the concept. But so you're welcome to do that. Um, and anyway, folks, thanks for joining us. Uh, for those who watch the replay, certainly feel free to send me an email with any feedback that you have. And uh, we'll see you again next week.